On this week's NFV SDN Reality Check, we speak with Brocade on NFV and SDN trends and the continued importance of open source platforms. Thanks for joining us this week. Uh, my name is Dan Meyer. I'm uh, your editor-in-chief at RCR Wireless News and host of uh, NFVSD and Reality Check here. And uh, today we are joined by Tom Nato, who's the uh, Distinguished Engineer and Chief Architect of Open Source Software at Brocade to talk a bit about a new book he has, but also the uh, great topic of NFV and SDN. So Tom, thanks for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. Hey, Dan. Thanks for having me on again. Very good. And yeah, I want to make sure that everybody knows as well. I think Tom was one of my first guests on the show way back in early 2015. So if you want to see how little I've progressed during the show, <laughs> go back and look at that. But, uh, but anyway, Tom, good to have you again. We definitely appreciate it. So, uh, well, yeah, yeah, obviously, I know you have a, a new book, and I want to make sure we do definitely uh, touch on that because, uh, you know, again, this topic of NFP uh, in, in the telecom space, at least, is still relatively new. I mean, again, a couple of years, but still relatively new. And it's good to have, a, I guess, a source out there uh, for people who maybe are still getting into the space or just new to the space to kind of, you know, get caught up a bit. So maybe you can touch a bit about, about the reason for the book and kind of what's, what's in the book. Yeah, so we, we, we started out with the idea of doing the book as a, as a survey, much like the first book on SDN. Um, and that's kind of how, how we approach things. We said, well, look, you know, what's going on in, in the NFV space, network function virtualization? Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, as usual with this stuff, there's a lot of hype and, and, and there's some reality. And, and so we tried to, uh, you know, show you where the, those things were uh, without, without making too many judgment calls uh, on what is what. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I think the initial feedback has been that it was, that it was done pretty well and, you know, pretty uh, kind of unbiased. You know, we, we definitely, you know, Ken Gray, sorry, I should mention my uh, co-author again. Um, you know, we tried to really um, take an objective look at the industry and the technology and see, you know, where things are going, define things, you know, for people um, without having to look this stuff up in 15 places. Um, and, and also sort of peel away the layers of the hype around this. I mean, there's, um, you know, as usual, there's a, there's a lot of sort of press articles that, um, you know, are driven by certain interests and, and this and that. And, you know, and so, so we just sort of tried to tried to play the role we're supposed to as engineers and, and just looked at the tech and said, look, this is the kind of reality. Um, and, uh, you know, some, some of the conclusions, you know, um, uh, you know, may, may not be, you know, super excellent depending on your perspective or what you're trying to sell. But, um, you know, again, our, our, our job is, as you know, engineers in this industry and all that stuff and driving some of this stuff, is really just to sort of lay it out um, and, and, and show what's there and show what's not there. Yeah, so, that's good again. Yeah. Yeah. And for those who are looking to, to get it, yeah, it's on, it's on Amazon. So you can always check it out there as well, but, uh, and we'll try to provide a link here as well to that. So, so people can check it out, but uh, it's always good. I, I think to have a reference like that, even for myself, uh, you know, I've been covering the industry for a while, the telecom side of things and to get some good background on the, on the virtualization of the SDN side of things is great as well. So yeah, again, I think it's a great, a great reference for people. Uh, who've been in the industry for a while, and also new people as well. So it's kind of good to have that out there. But uh, it's, I hope so. Yeah, it's great for that. So let me step back a bit. I guess maybe a little overview on Brocade for those who don't know much about you guys. I know you guys have been in the space for quite some time. Uh, maybe just a little, little kind of a little, uh, couple minute background on, on the company, what you guys do in terms of uh, the SDN. Okay. Yeah. So Brocade, Brocade actually does a number of um, a number of things in the you know in the network telecom space. Um, traditionally, Brocade has spent. Uh, a lot of time and effort um, in the SAN, uh, SAN space, storage or networking, where, you know, the number one uh, SAM OEM, ben OEM vendor. Uh, I think if you look around, you, you know, I think 85% or something of the, of the marketplace resells our, resells our tech. Um, beyond that, uh, we have um, data networking equipment. You know, we have the VDX, ICX, uh, MLX, and now SLX. Uh, products that are out. Those are uh, various uh, campus LAN service provider types of switching and routing products. Um, and, you know, those, those compete well with, with everything, you know, all the usual suspects that are out there. Um, 
you know, and then we work hard to kind of, we've worked hard to kind of pair that with uh, the sand, uh, sand products to make a, a, a nice experience uh, for, for users. Beyond that, um, about, I don't know, three, three and a half years ago, um, uh, some of the folks at Brocade, uh, Ken Chang, our CTO, and some of the other folks took a look, you know, at the trajectory going forward and said, hey, you know, we need to sort of expand our portfolio and get into the software networking and FV, well, then it was SDN, uh, and now in a V space. Uh, and so uh, our software business unit has a variety of products in that space, a virtual router, a, a, a virtual ADC, ADX, and then of course the um, products uh, I've worked on, which are the um, open daylight based controller uh, and associated applications, as well as um, uh, our OpenStack uh, efforts as well, mm -hmm. and Tacker, which is which is also uh, orchestration uh, product in that space, and and we do have products around all of these things. So so that's you know Brocade sort of you know that's that was sort of Brocade's journey, uh, and then a couple of months ago you know we acquired Ruckus Wireless, so now we're we're focusing even further in the campus land uh, space as well to sort of round out the product portfolio. Very nice, very nice. Well, I guess I maybe looking back a bit on, and I, I, you know, the last time we talked was in early 2015, and obviously you're coming from the engineering side of things, which is uh, always good to get a good perspective from that. But I guess what's been your general view of, I guess, the, 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 the pace of development and deployment in terms of NFV uh, by, by the telecom space? It does seem like, like you said, there's been a lot of hype around it, I think, over the past uh, couple of months. It seems to have died down a bit. I think there's a little more reality setting in. But uh, what's been, I guess, your general view of kind of how it's progressed over the past, you know, you know year or two uh, so far? It, it's, it's been like riding a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way, right? <laughs> in a good way. I mean, it's, it's out of control, but it's in a good way. Um, the, the pace, I've never been, I've never worked in an environment uh, where the pace has been so relentless and, and rapid. Um, you know, things 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 evolve things are built uh, and then they're consumed in this sort of snowball right and and like the stuff i've been involved in is primarily open source related stuff and you can see uh how we started with sdn um in this space and and uh we're at the point now where you know for example the controller wars are over right i mean if you're trying to sell a proprietary controller you know good luck <laughs> um you know open daylight is one yeah, uh, one that you know we've done that, and and what's interesting is um, the the NFV sort of thing now has subsumed the controller conversation, and and so like I was just rereading the forward in my book that Dave Ward wrote, and uh, where he he really sort of sums the whole thing up very well in the first few pages, where he says, you know, the controller wars are over. And, you know, that hype cycle has, has completed in a lot of ways, the SDN hype cycle, but just, you know, halfway through that one or three quarters through that one, now we're on our way with NFV and, you know, service function chaining um, and, and even further up the stack, right, which is uh, the, the sort of next frontier of this. But so that's an interesting thing we're seeing is, is projects evolve rapidly and, they're not, they're not sort of end of life or anything, but they just assumed to kind of do what they do. Um, and then we build upon that like Lego blocks, um, up and up the stack we go, uh, as I say, um, <laughs> so it's, it's been relentless and, and a fever pitch thing, but it's, it's also, it's also fun. And it's also very, uh, very cool in the sense that, you know, I, I've worked in this industry for whatever, 20 plus years and starting about, four or five years ago, maybe four years ago in earnest, um, maybe in, maybe in earnest, um, we had, um, uh, this transition in the industry where, uh, people realized that like, you know, code is king and that, you know, you have to build things and not talk about them. And so this whole <laughs> process sort of got turned on its head. Meanwhile, you know, if you weren't writing code, you, you had no, uh, you know, cachet or, or sort of credibility in the industry. You know, code is the new, uh, you know, form of currency. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, and it's really interesting too. the thing that I've, I've witnessed um, 
is that any piece of code, any, any day has a very ephemeral quality, right? A week from now, something else could be invented that or, or extended or build upon it. That's the snowball effect I'm talking about. I think everybody's sort of, you know, riding on this, 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 this thing uh-huh. that's, that's progressing. Um, it's very cool too, because it's very heartening that everybody is sort of working on stuff. And if yeah. you're not working on stuff, well, <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I, guess, I guess I mean, how's the cooperation in terms of, of kind of everybody, every, everybody behind the scenes working on this? Because it does seem like that once you get past kind of the, the you know the PR stuff and everything, it does seem like people are very uh, uh, cooperative in terms of kind of working towards the same common goal. Obviously, there are you know different companies have different agendas at the end of the day, but I guess are you seeing uh, improvements in terms of that aspect of it of, of kind of getting everybody on the same page? Uh, and agreeing that, hey, you know, this is what we're trying to do. The carriers have these requirements. And to meet those, we need to kind of do this stuff. And then we need to kind of all play along together to make this all, make this all happen. It's, it's a little, of, it's a little of, 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 of a bunch of those things, okay. right? I think, I think behind the scenes when you, um, you know, when the engineers sit down on projects, there's actually not, you know, most of the, most of the projects that, that we've worked on in, in open daylight, OPNV, uh, you know, open O and, and, and these other projects, uh, open stack. Mm-hmm. When you boil it all down and you actually peel away all that stuff you talked about, mm-hmm. there might be eight or 10 people actually working on any, any one major component. And those, those folks, you know, are just engineers, right? They just, they want to get things done. <laughs> Obviously not people, people don't agree on everything all the time. Yeah work through it that that's actually been an it you know as to touch on on that and the open source experience that's been i, I was talking about that uh, just last week at the open daylight summit mm-hmm. that's been really an interesting change for me uh in that um there's not really any top-down control of any of this stuff and it's it's got to work itself out on its own mm-hmm. right so you can't you know, when, when, and, and this has happened, you know, the, the, nothing is perfect in open daylight and some of the other projects we were actually uh, recounting uh, some of the past experiences we've had over the last three years in the project. And, you know, some of them are not pretty to be honest, but <laughs> details, give us details. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there were, there were, you know, there are certain people who disagreed about okay. doing this or that. And, yeah. and what ended up happening is we, and this is normal in open source. You you build both of them and you see who wants to use what. Mm-hmm. And, you know, eventually one of them withered on the vine and the other one carried on. And that's what we have. And that's, you know, there's a, cer- there's a certain level of patience that you need to bring to the party that you didn't before. Although I, I think uh, sort of like, um, uh, you know, a fine wine, you know, it's, it's actually your patience is rewarded, Yeah. you know, for waiting, right. Rather than, you know, drinking it early, wait a little while longer and it'll taste better. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And it does seem like too, with the open source community, I mean, like you said, kind of that, that instead of the top down, but the bottom up approach has really been kind of what core to the open source, what they've been trying to do. I mean, talking with all those guys with ODL or OPNFE or uh, all the various ones that are out there to the Linux foundation, it does seem like that's been kind of their goal. And I know initially, you know, talking about those initiatives did seem to kind of cause some concern for uh, the telecom side of things because operators mm-hmm. are traditionally used to having such rigid uh, guidelines and they, they know things are going to work. And that seemed like that was going to be a bit of a concern. And I think even initially, some of the open source guys were a little, hey, how are we going to make this all work in the end? But it seems like over the past year, it has really kind of, it's kind of, you know, the, the proof is there now that this is kind of the way to do it. Even the operators have become much more, uh, you know, vocal and their support of open source. I mean, they're all talking about that's what they want to do now. Yeah, and yeah. It seems like it's really, it's, it's interesting to kind of see that, that evolution of how it's all kind of moved over the past, you know, six, 12, 18 months. Really. Yeah. Well, it works. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a, so, so one thing to understand about open source is that, and I think, I think operators, you know, not just telco operators, but enterprise operators, et cetera, are, are coming around to realizing that, it's it's not like a hippie commune thing, really, <laughs> you know, cool and free and whatever. It's it's actually it's a business model and a development model, right? I mean, it's a serious thing. It's 
you know, it's sort of like the transition from waterfall to agile software development, right? Where we, um, you know, we, we changed the paradigm and there was a bit of a leap of faith that you had to take, you know, like I can say personally agile, I thought it was a crock <laughs> when it, when I was first explained to me, I said, what do you, what do you mean? You don't plan everything out at the beginning? Cause that's, <laughs> that's the way we had done it. Right. And, but you know, one major project later, you know, I was a believer, right. And, and, um, and not just a, not a believer, but, a I mean, I, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding and it was there. We made a lot of really good pudding. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and it's, it's the same way uh, with open source in terms of a development paradigm, right? It's not, a, um, it's not a magical thing that just appears, right? There's a lot of hard work that has to happen. It's just a different structure to get that work done. Um, and like you just said, you know, it's a sort of a bottom-up approach with a little mix of a little top-down advice, mm -hmm. Right. So a lot of these projects will have some sort of architecture team or committee or technical steering committee or, or whatever. And, um, you know, those those folks try to set a direction collaboratively mm -hmm. that the rest of the dev teams follow. Although, you know, as I said earlier, nobody is uh, obliged to follow those 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 orders. Right. They can decide to do what they want to do. Uh, and we've seen that happen. Um, sometimes uh, successfully and sometimes not, but it's it's just a, it's a different model, and it, and until you've witnessed it um, and and seen the fruits that it generates, um, you you don't believe it. And I think that's what's happened, you know, like with telcos when when we first approached, you know, for example, you know, you know, publicly, AT and T is using our product now in production and widely in production. Well, uh, when we first approached them to use this stuff, um, you know, they were not too enthusiastic about it. Um, they had tried to play around with it themselves and maybe for the prior six months they had tried. And they said, this stuff is crazy. We don't know how this works. And it's all just this sort of chaotic mess. How do you actually, how can you convince me to use this in production? And, you know, that that's actually part of, um, uh, part of the, the sort of, product that we offer right is we sort of sort out and smooth over the, the chaos you know we act like a capacitor for these guys um and and as you can see it works right i mean they wouldn't be doing this in production on that scale if it didn't work um so it's it's a bit of faith and it's a bit of you know sort of rolling your sleeves up and getting involved and like those guys for example have been fantastic partners in that they are not only um you know, consumers of the, of the product, but they're also, uh, participants, active participants. So now they're starting to write code. They're starting to, uh, review code. They're participating in the community and the user communities. And, and now you've seen e for example, open e has come forward. So these are, you know, these are signs that, you know, signs of the, pro the progression, the real progression, not just the hype. Yeah. And, and I think that's important. And, and, and so you're seeing, you know, you've seen the SDN stuff. Now you're seeing the NFV stuff um, in that same uh, sort of context. Yeah, now so I was going to ask you a bit about, I guess, how important is it in, uh, to have kind of the operators involved in this? Because it does seem like, like you said, it, you know, at t for one and other operators as well have been very vocal about their work in the space. And uh, it does seem like, like you said, they are starting to kind of become more open to open source. And it even seems like at t for instance, they're putting some of their own stuff back into the open source community now as well. Um, I, I guess, has that been a pretty positive experience having them uh, at the table a lot of the time, helping you guys kind of, you know, know what they want at the, at the end of the day, kind of providing some sort of guidance that way as well? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a double-edged sword because they don't, honestly, they don't always know what they want, right? <laughs> and, and they sort of like, you know, the example I gave where you have, you know, you can pick the green pill or the red pill, <laughs> you know, they, they sort of, they're not sure, right? Yeah. Um, and what, what actually makes it a, a more sure decision on their part is more participation. And you can see that now. And in, in fact, if you go, I can tell you, you know, with certainty, 85% of our telco customers um, uh, and uh, federal customers, you, you, I don't know if you read recently the, the federal um, policy statement that came out with um, uh, uh, DOD, et cetera, that uh, all projects will have open source components, um, not just for the security implications, but 
for all of these things we've been talking about, mm-hmm. you know, just getting involved and helping steer the direction of these products and projects um, rather than standing on the sidelines and handing over requirements documents, they can actually write some of the code now mm-hmm. um, or all the code. I mean, it, you know, uh, we, we have, we have some, some partners that work with us that um, develop a lot of their own code in, you know, certain narrow areas of, of projects. Um, and, you know, obviously they're not, you know, they don't, they don't have a, a, the staff like a Google or for example, but you know, they're trying and they're also, you know, they're now uh, their first choice is to consume open source products. Um, and it's for all the good reasons we've been talking about. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, I mean, you can touch a bit about, uh, I know you guys did some recent work with ODL, uh, uh, as well, I maybe mean, just give a little background on that and kind of what what came out of that, that latest partnership with uh, with ODL and, and Brocade. Yeah, I mean, when when I when I got here, um, Brocade was you know was a platinum member in ODL, but really hadn't hadn't done anything other than you know sort of at the technical steering level. Mm-hmm. Literally, only had one person participating. So you know, we we went from zero to a, a fairly large team. I think the team had four has 40 something people now. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, those people are split between upstream development and downstream uh, product generation, you know, packaging, uh, support application development, all that. And so it's, it's been a, it's been a bit of a journey figuring that out, right. Building a commercial distribution of the product, which um, you know, one of the things uh you know, there've been other efforts to do this and a lot of, I think most of them have failed. And, and a lot of it is because um, people did not embrace the development model we just talked about. Mm-hmm. They, for, they would fork the product or they would show up and grab some code and leave um, and not actively participate in the community. That is actually a key ingredient in this recipe is the active involvement. And, and some, something like a third of the team here actually actively participates upstream you know, and, and actually pushes code upstream and participates in the community. If you don't do that, you know, you're, um, you know, you're, first of all, you're, you're letting somebody else drive the whole, the whole show. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you're just a consumer and a repackager of some kind. Um, and, and second, um, you know, if, if you're not actively involved in the code writing, you, you don't know what, is going on right sometimes there are tricky issues sometimes you know we've had um last minute patches we've had to add in our releases and whatnot that you know had hadn't this guy talked to that guy talked to that guy we wouldn't have known you know and it's 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 part of the it's part of the cost of of doing doing that kind of business um you know you wouldn't you wouldn't generally develop your own proprietary product through some third party uh, and, and then just take what they give you. Right. Yeah. So it's the same kind of thing. So, so our relationship with ODL, with the ODL organization and the Linux foundation has been a uh, very, very much a tight sort of collaborative thing. And we've invested in a variety of those projects, um, not just in terms of engineering resources, but, you know, we've, um, you know, our memberships and, and, um, and that kind of participation too. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I know whenever I've talked to either ODL or OPNFE or uh, any of those other other organizations, I mean, that's they always mention that active participation is so key to what they're doing. And you know, it's almost like they're trying to like drill it into my head. I mean, they say it to me so many times, and, and just it's yeah, it's it's kind of true. I mean, they really do want people involved in this. They don't want to just be you know, hey, go do this. They want you guys back and forth. They really want to be part of the have everybody part of the process, which is uh, interesting to hear from them. It's not obvious when you first get into it. Yeah, that, that that is a key ingredient to to this thing. But I mean, I think if you look back at you know any any successful open source projects that are out there, um, participation. Well, I mean, you know, we've been just been talking about this. I mean, somebody has to write the code. <laughs> and if end of the day, you know, somebody's got to do the work. And you're you know, if you want to be part of the solution, you better write some code. So yeah. that's, that's kind of the plan and figuring out what the mix is between upstream and downstream is, you know, it varies depending on the project, the product you're creating, you know, how much, how much horsepower your organization has, but you, you've got to, you've got to make that a key element in your business strategy around this, 
I think, or you're not going to succeed. Interesting. Interesting. Well, you seem to be looking forward a bit. I mean, what do you see as some of the big challenges out there? I mean, obviously, like you mentioned earlier that uh, perhaps the SDN uh, wars, at least for the controllers, is, is, is all done. Uh, that's good to know. But I guess as you look ahead a bit, you know, what's kind of uh, the next big challenge for both Brocade, but also kind of for the open source community in general as they kind of look to kind of meet the needs of, of the telecom and the operator space out there? Well, there's there's a couple of things happening. I mean, in the open source space, I think an honest question that people are asking today is, um, is the Linux Foundation really the place, you know, is, is where all of this stuff should be happening? As you, you've probably seen a proliferation of projects, projects coming out of the LF, um, many of which are competing with each other, right? I mean, in, in just in the controller space, we have ODL and Onos right now in the Linux Foundation, and now there's talk of bringing, uh, you know, open contrail in there or something. Yeah. Um, so people are asking the honest question of, you know, what's going on here? You know, is this, <laughs> is this an incubator of some kind or is this, a, you know, what are we doing? Um, so, so there's that. And then, um, you know, I think the other question kind of around the tech uh, that we've been talking about uh, is, is how high is the stack going to go? Right. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of N of E, um, you know, there, and we talk about this in the book actually is, um, in, in terms of a, a detailed analysis. Um, I think, you know, we have, um, there's this promise or this hype in the industry that you can virtualize everything, right? I mean, if you talk to any of the server vendors and all that, they'll, they'll assure you, you can save all kinds of money and you can virtualize everything, right? And we have products in that space and all that, like everybody else. The question is, is, you know, and what is the reality of that? And I think what you'll find today anyway, at this moment in time is that the answer is no, you cannot virtualize everything, <laughs> but you can, but you know, your mileage will definitely vary. <laughs> um, and you know, that's the kind of analysis Ken and I did, which was to look at what is the reality in terms of server hardware architecture and sort of related horsepower as well as network interface card, NICs, um, uh, you know, advancement and all that. And, the conclusion today is that there's definitely a spectrum is the way that we kind of look at it of virtualiz virtualization or sort of potential virtualization compared to um, the physical version, the, you know, the actual version. Um, in a lot of cases, the reality doesn't match the hype, unfortunately, right? There are cases where you have IO bound, um, IO bound workloads that it's better to just, buy the actual thing, you know, instead of the virtualized thing. Um, you know, there are a lot of cases though, where, you know, there are things you definitely can virtualize, right? We're finding, um, you know, non IO bound workloads. Definitely, you know, you can do that, but you know, there's, and then there's this, this funny gray area in the middle, right? Where it depends. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing we've done is sort of on another axis, not just the sort of hardware IO performance, but on the other axis, you have to add in the sort of the total cost of ownership. Mm -hmm. so when you virtualize something, you're not just virtualizing something and running it on a server. You have to manage the server. You have to manage, you know, the, the um, NFVs you're running, you know, the, the I mean, the VNFs mm -hmm. that you're running. Um, you have to manage the server. You have to manage the network. You know, and so you, you know, and, and, and sort of in, in um, the preface of the book, Dave writes, uh, he asks this very profound question, which is how high does the stack go? And I think the answer to that question will answer the, the previous question, which is whether or not you should actually virtualize something. <laughs> oh, there goes my lights. There's a light. There it is. Um, so that actually is, is, you know, those two axes are very important to analyze, right? And, and to determine, I think. You know, I think if you step back and you look at the hype or you, you look at like the Etsy model, mm -hmm. the assumption is, of course, you can virtualize everything. But I, I think the reality is you, you can't today. Yeah. And like uh, you said, too, it's, it's definitely on a case-by-case -case basis as well as, as mm -hmm. to what people want to do exactly. I mean, again, it depends what your operations are and kind of what you're looking to do with you. The reality is you, you, it may actually cost more to virtualize things than just deploying a physical thing. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's uh, you know, you got to really do the analysis. The devil's in the details. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, that's great insight. Well, and again, I would definitely recommend those who are looking to get some more insight on this 
uh, check out the book. I think you have a copy of the book there, if I'm correct. You hold that up there so people can yeah, see Yeah, I do. Get it there. I don't know if you can see it. It's sort of like an extreme close-up. Yeah, there we, there we go. We can find it. Again, it's on Amazon. Uh, you can check it out there. Uh, I, I know I've got my copy in order, so I need to have a good reference to that too. But, <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, it's a great book. Again, great insights. Always good to have some reference there as well. But, uh, but Tom, definitely appreciate uh, you taking the time to speak with us. And obviously, it's always good to get uh, a good uh, engineering perspective on things as opposed to a lot of the, uh, the hype that happens out there. So we, also, we always appreciate that as well. So thanks so much for taking the time today. Well, thanks for watching this week's show and make sure to check out our next show when we speak with Level 3 to gain some insight into the interaction between service providers and vendors on developing solutions to support of SDN platforms. Thanks for watching. NFV SDN Reality Check with Dan Meyer is a production of RCR TV. To suggest show topics or to reach Dan, you can find him on email dmeyer at rcrwireless.com and on Twitter at Meyer underscore Dan. For more Dan, news on NFVSDN and everything wireless, find your way over to rcrwireless.com.